Numbers chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron the following instructions. When you set up the seven lamps in the lampstand, place them so their light shines forward. Everybody say, shines forward. In front of the lampstand. So Aaron did this. He set up the seven lamps so they reflected their light forward just as the Lord had commanded Moses. The entire lampstand from its base to its decorative blossoms was made of beaten gold. It was built according to the exact design the Lord had shown Moses. Lord, we thank you again for all that you've done, you're doing, and you're going to do. Now, Lord, even in the service today, uh, this week, and the, the days ahead. Now, right now, as we get into your word, Holy Spirit, would you help me? I cannot do this on my own, nor do I want to. Holy Spirit, I need your help. Give me divine revelation, unction, Lord God, and the power to, Lord God, present your word, Lord. And I pray you give us all that are hearing and receiving it, myself included, the ability to not only receive it and get downloaded in our spirit, but the grace to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord gave specific guidelines for the placement of this elaborate lampstand in the holy place of the tabernacle. The Hebrew name is the the menorah. It's M-E-N-O-R-A-H in Hebrew. Check out this picture. When we were in Israel, this is an actual, it's been recreated. This was the first golden lampstand that was recreated since the second temple was destroyed. Or as a photo Craig to, uh, to Ricky Boudreaux right there. That was his picture from my Israel trip. We, uh, we had a photo circle app and everybody's uploading their pictures. And I had one on my phone, but that one came out way better. So this is a recreation. It's actually six foot tall. And this is the actual lampstand. If you can see we're in Jerusalem right here. It's bulletproof glass around it. When the third and final temple is built, this is the actual lampstand that's going in it. This is actually the one that we got to see. And so it just gives you a visual of what he was talking about. These are made according to the specs from the tabernacles to both temples, right? And uh, in Numbers 8, as it talks about this, as God's given Moses instruction to Aaron and the priests what to do, this lampstand, this picture of this lampstand and these instructions is a great picture for us in the New Testament church today as New Testament disciples. You're like, well, Brandon, what, what are you talking about? Well, remember, Jesus compares us to lamps. Look at Matthew 5, 14 and 16. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Not you might be or you should be. He said, you are. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus did say that to let our light shine, but we know we're not the source of the light, right? He's the source. John 1, 9, listen to what John says. Speaking of Jesus, the one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. This is him speaking of Jesus in, in John 1. Remember, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word is God. And he continues to elaborate on that. And look at Matthew 5, 14 again in the Amplified. You are the light of Christ to the world. Right? So he says, let your light shine. But we're not the source of light. It's also like, as, as I'm sure all of you know, the moon at night, if it's a full moon, the moon gives off light. But the moon doesn't have any source of light. Right? It's reflecting off of the sun. The sun, should I say, is reflecting its light off of the moon. And it's the same with us. It actually even says this in Numbers 8, 3 about the lampstand. Aaron says, set up the lamp so they reflect their light forward, right? So we are to reflect the light of Christ that is inside of us by the Holy Spirit. See, since there was no windows in the holy place of the tabernacle, the only source of light was this golden lampstand. See, back then, this light provided uh, and aided in the worship of the priests and, and, and the offerings in the tabernacle and later in the temple. But again, Jesus said to let our light shine in this very dark world. Church, I don't think I need to take much time in convincing you that this world is getting darker and darker every day. Am I right or am I wrong? Every day we're, we're in a dark world. So this command to let our light shine is more prevalent today and pressing than ever before. Would you not agree? See, letting our light shine is the attractive qualities of Christ. When the attractive qualities of a disciple of Christ can draw people to the light of Christ, and hopefully they begin to live and glorify God, as these 20 people just showed that in publicly that they're ready to do or that they're doing. Amen? 
What a blessing. So today I want to encourage you and share with you, how do you shine your light forward? And I love that. Shine your light forward. That's what caught me the first time the Lord ever showed me this. Don't just let your light shine. Shine it forward, right? So how do you shine your light forward? Well, number one, obviously we have already read it, but be intentional. Everybody say intentional. Be intentional to do good to others. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, let your light shine before men, and that's all people, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, right? I just read it in verse 3, reflect your light forward. And Lord, it said, set up the lamps to reflect your light forward. Shining forward, I love that word, moving forward. It means doing something. It means producing something. If we're letting our light shine, there should be some tangible fruit that we can see that our light's going forth. Isn't that right? Let your light shine forward, not just a stagnant light, right? See, this is, of course, we know serving people, helping people, reaching out to people, caring for people, loving people, taking people in. Now, Yeah, amen. Everybody would agree? Now, let me add this. Even people you don't like. That makes it a little bit harder, right? And I'm talking to myself, right? It's easy to serve somebody you love and that you like and that you, 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 you know. But what about the people that you struggle with? Everybody had somebody probably come through their mind when I said that, right? You know, maybe you're going, you're going to be working next to them tomorrow morning or, or whatnot, right? But it's being intentional. See, when we do this, we're not only serving others and following Christ's command, we're also being an example to those around us, especially those closest to us. You know, this is something simple, but as I was preparing, I was reminded that years ago, we went on a, a snow ski trip, my whole family, my wife and I, and, and our girls, and, and, and my son, and, 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 and Joey and the girls were all little, and we were tubing, right? The girls tried skiing and stuff, they're still kind of little, so we, we figured out we can jump in some tubes and just go down in the snow on the hill, and it was fun. And so I had the girls tandem to me in, a, in, in uh two inner tubes and I was I would have to hold like hold them get on and then we'd all go down together well there was a little boy that was trying to get on the tube by himself and he was struggling I don't remember how old he was or whatnot and he was just kind of struggling so I told the girls hey hold on I'll be with you in a minute and I came and I helped the little boy to get on his tube and then I you know uh, let him go down and when I got back on the tubes one of my girls said dad I was wondering if you were going to help that little boy and the other one said yeah because that's what Christians do so I'm like, man, I passed the test. They were like, I guess they were waiting for me to say, hey, am I going to do a good deed uh, for this little guy? And so, hey, but it just reminds me, church, people are watching us. Your children are watching you. I was reminded of that that day, right? Something simple like that, doing a good deed for this little boy so he can go tubing down, right? It reminds us, right? It reminds me what James talks about faith, right? We're talking about the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world, having faith in Christ. James 2.18, you know, James was going back and forth about some say you have faith and some say you have good works. James picks up in James 2.18, I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? Jesus said, let your light shine by doing good deeds. James continues on. If we say we have faith, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Later in verse 20, he says, can't you see that faith without deeds is useless? We can have all the faith in the world. This is awesome. We worship. We pray. We have events. We do this. But if we're not doing good to others, James, the Bible says it's useless. We got to be intentional to do good to others. Now, I know the, the, the context here is faith, but we have faith in the light, right? In Jesus. So obviously it applies to this. See, people can't see your light unless you show them. And one of the ways you show them is with good works, good deeds, doing, serving. As you heard before and you've already seen, I thank you already. What is it, like 90-some people, 80-some people signed up for Serve Week already, uh, Pastor Dixie? So I know some of you are already on board, but just to remind you, I'm actually going to be kicking off a new series next Sunday speaking about this specifically and what God's called us to do in serving. But I felt like the Lord led me to this message to preach today. So Serve Week is a way that we do this corporately. We, we work hard, our staff works hard to come up with uh, 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 projects and outreaches around the community uh, that we can do to serve our community, to do good deeds to those that we maybe have never met and maybe never see again. But if you go cut somebody's grass or pressure wash or do these things, that's shining in your life. When people say, man, why are you doing this? Because we love Jesus and we love you. Man, how you love me? You don't even know me. Yeah, you know it, but Jesus loves you. And I love Jesus, so I love you. Amen. 
doing good deeds. So Serve Week is a great way to jump in. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't signed up yet, we have different things we're going to be doing. And we try to scale down some of the more intricate stuff so more people can get involved in things that will be across the board. Helping, feeding the homeless, witnessing, evangelizing, going to nursing homes, things like that. Amen. So I want to encourage you to jump in the vision. We're helping you to carry out the command of Christ to do good deeds and let our light shine. Amen. Second thing, second way you let your light shine forward is not only do you show people by your actions what you do, but at some point you have to be a witness with your words. You got to eventually preach the gospel. You got to eventually tell people the truth about Jesus. John 1, 8, John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to what? Tell about the light. John the Baptist came. He was the forerunner of Christ. And his main job was to preach and to tell people to, to, that, that Jesus, the Messiah, was coming. Now he said, well, Brandon, I'm not a preacher like you. And I understand that. Not everybody's a preacher that will preach from the stage or even be able to easily witness. But all of us can be a witness with our words. Every single one of us. you got a story to tell. Every one of us got a story to tell. One of the most powerful uh, sermons in the Bible, and I've said it a lot, is the man that was healed. And he said, you know what? They asked him all kind of questions theologically. He said, I don't know about all that. All I know is this. I was blind. Now I can see. He testified about Jesus. I love that. I was telling Pastor Jairus the other day, we were in the apartment here. We were laughing because I had an encounter with a man that had uh, of a, of a, of a a, a really large denomination that I, I was working, I was painting, and, and I, man, I was just on fire for the Lord. I was fasting, and, and we started getting into this, this debate about the Bible and different things, and, and I didn't know a whole lot. He was telling me about early church history and stuff, and man, I butchered some things. I said, I had Pastor Jay Rowland the other day in the office about what I said. You know, I didn't know all that stuff. But I basically told him, look, man, I was a pillhead, pothead, alcoholic that was depressed and struggling, and Jesus saved me and delivered me. And I'm like, and now I'm here. Amen. That was my message. I didn't know a bunch of scriptures. I didn't know early church history. I didn't know about the Protestant Reformation at the time. I know about all that stuff now, but I just knew I was blind. Now I can see. And I was able to testify. Amen. And it was a good laugh for Jairus 22 years later. So it worked out good. <laughs> so listen, like, the, like, like in school, you got show and tell. We must both show and tell. People say, man, I just love on people. And that's good. Hey, your gift will make a way for you. Love on them, buy them coffee, cut their grass, bake cookies. That's good. But eventually, you got to go out and tell them. We had two brothers in the church went do that yesterday. They do it almost every week. They went out downtown. If you know, they got some pretty interesting stuff happening downtown. And they didn't know. And they went down there and they went witnessing in the midst of all of that. What a blessing. Amen. And I got a text from a fellow brother who's in ministry. And, and, and that I'm looking. There's another evangelistic event that churches are putting together that I would like to be a part of. I need to find out more details. But I love that stuff. I love people being intentional. They do this almost every week and they go downtown. And they witness straight up. They're out there to pray and to speak the truth of the gospel. And you can do this in your everyday life, regardless of how much of the Bible you know or what limitations you think you have. As I said, first of all, you share your story. Your testimony is powerful. I was here. I met Jesus. Now I'm here. One scripture you need to know, John 3.16. It's the Bible in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You can ask him, do you want to trust in? That word believe means to trust. Do you want to trust and believe in Jesus right now? You can lead somebody to the Lord with your story in John 3.16. Amen? And if you need some more help from there, we got people, our pastors, we can help you and, and go through. I know people want to get into all, why does God allow bad things to happen and all that? And, 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 and you do have to get into some of that stuff. But I, I just, after all these years, I've studied a lot. I've, I've done Bible college courses. People ask me hard questions. I'm, I'm very confident to say, I don't know. I don't know every, I don't know why God allows this or does this or that, but I know God is good and I know what he's done in my life and I've seen him radically change other people's lives. I know there's still people getting saved and baptized every day and every Sunday around our, our community and our nation. And so, you know, of course we want to help you and better equip you. And we, we do have further ways that we can train you and help you to evangelize. But listen again, so it goes back to that. You may not know, feel like you know much. Also, and I'm, I'll get into that later. The Holy Spirit will help you. He'll help you when you get into those tough conversations. I'm going to get into that in a minute. Also, your limitations. I, I, I speak of this lady probably every year, maybe every other year, because she was just such an amazing woman of God. 
How many of y'all remember Karen Prejean, who went to be with the Lord? She was a part of our church. Karen Prejean used to preach the gospel. She would tell people about Jesus. Listen to me now. And she couldn't even speak. She would literally tell people about the Lord and couldn't speak. Karen had ALS. She was on in, in, a, in a bed, could not move any of her body, couldn't even move her mouth. All she could do is blink, and she could smile, and she could she can cry. And so some of you know about ALS, and this was years ago. The way they communicate is there's a screen that watches, there's a camera that watches her eyes, and everywhere her eyes would go, the screen looks at it, and she could type using her eyes. So when I'd go to her house, I'd go there and pray with her and give her communion and fellowship with her. If I walked up and said, hey, Karen, how you doing today? I'd have to be very patient, but she'd look at the screen and she'd start looking at all the different letters. And then eventually the computer would talk back and say, I'm doing good, Brandon. How are you? And so that's how she would communicate. But she was also on social media. She was on Facebook and she would email people. So Karen could not even use her mouth, words, or vocal cords, yet she could use her eyes to type out and preach the gospel on Facebook. Amen? A lot of you know Michelle Laverne. Michelle and Freddie Laverne, she was sitting in first service. Karen Prejean is the one who invited Michelle to this church, and Michelle got saved. And now she's been a huge part of our church. She was on our staff as a receptionist for years. And so I'm just, it reminds me of that. That like, man, you look at Karen, she has ALS, couldn't even move or talk, and yet she was using her, did, her eyes and technology to preach the gospel, to literally lay out the gospel. Listen, guys, I say it all the time. You probably get sick of me saying it, but I'm going to keep saying it. How dark this world is, how dark the internet and social media is. We should be the ones flooding it with light, especially during an election year. Come on, somebody. Things are just going to get ramped up and get nastier and nastier. Why not us flood the internet with light and pray? Ask the Lord to, to help you to be creative. I know my, my kids probably don't like this, but I, I want to honor them just like I honor Nate and the worship team and the serve team. But I remember going on vacations too and our kids were small. And before we'd leave a hotel and we'd check out, they would start writing little notes for the cleaning crew that we're coming after. Jesus loves you. You're beautiful. Repent of your sins. Jesus will forgive you if you want to go to heaven. You know, like they were laying out the gospel as children and just leaving it there. I'd seen my girls many a times when they're young and even more recently where we go through a drive through and they would tell my girls, one of my girls would tell my wife, hey, mama, tell that girl, that lady, she's beautiful. And you could see pe- girls choking up, right? You could see ladies, you could see people busy and frantic. And when they hear a little girl saying, hey, my daughter, my wife would say, my daughter wants you to know you're beautiful. And you just see the look on their face, they stop. Yo, that's being a light. That's being a witness, right? In those moments like that, right? Ask the Lord to help you to be creative. This reminds me of, of Ephesians 5, 16 that says, Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Are our days getting more and more evil or not? So listen, guys. Y'all can make the most of every opportunity to, to show your good deeds, to be a witness with your words, I would say starting tomorrow morning, but starting this afternoon if you're going out to eat lunch. I shared this with the first service, and I've shared it before. My wife used to be a server. She worked in two or three different restaurants as a server. And this is a true story. She confirmed in first service. When she was a server, the other service she used to work with said that they hated working Sunday afternoon shifts because of the church crowd. They said the church crowd was mean and they didn't tip good. What an indictment against the church. Right? The true story, right, babe? So listen, I want to encourage you. Why don't we change that narrative? If you're going to eat lunch this afternoon, why don't you be kind and, and love on people and, and, and encourage them and tell them they're doing a good job? Tip them a little extra, man. Five, ten dollars ain't going to make you or break you, right? Amen? Why don't you, let, let's, let us be the best tippers out there, right? And it's so true. And look, we've seen it. I, I've seen it. I can remember years ago, just in, in doing your thing. Years ago, we were youth pastors. We had our, a youth leadership meeting at a restaurant. And our, our food had got there. And so our, our waiter walked off. And we started praying over the food. And she walked back. And the waitress walked back. And she's like, that was a beautiful prayer. And because of us praying, open the door, an opportunity, we began to witness to her. We started laying out the gospel and got to pray for her right there. Just a couple years ago, uh, for our Christmas party, we have a Christmas party at lunch at noon, and we were at a restaurant, and and uh, this lady, uh, it actually wasn't a Christmas party. It was a party to honor Nathan. The worship team wanted to honor him, and it was Brother James. James was sitting with us at our table and went around and said, well, let me get your names for individual tickets. She said, what's your name? And he said, James. And the lady said, she, she kind of stopped. She said, that was my brother's name, James. He just died. 
It's like, oh, we're so sorry. We get an minister to that lady. Just talked to her as she came back and forth. Nathan and Jane started inviting her. Before, when everybody left at the end of the night, we was able to get up and lay hands on her in the restaurant right there and pray for her. Amen? You know, listen, guys, make the most of every opportunity. I know you're going to eat this afternoon if you are. Come on, let's change that narrative. Come on, wouldn't it be great if service starts saying, man, I love working the Sunday crowd, and people are kind, and they're good tippers. Remember, hey, listen, about your tip. The Bible says your gift will make a way for you. You know, just doing that, just going extra and just blessing somebody, even when they mess up, if they spill your drink, it's okay, they're going to get you another drink. Even if they spill it on your pants, you can wash it when you get home, amen? Come on, let's be different than the rest. Let's be a witness of how we act and a witness with our words. And then also, you know, bring people to where the light's going to be. Obviously, church services on a weekly basis, life group, man cave and thrive night. This week coming up, right? We got man cave and thrive night. Men, wild game cookout in September, amen? Come on, we're going to, it's awesome. We got an NFL Hall of Famer that's going to be our guest speaker who's a pastor now. And man, it's going to be a great time in the ladies retreat uh, in October. Man, all these things we have invite, these are all events evangelistic things to bring people to where the light's at. And I almost got ahead of myself. But let's go back to that lampstand. Abby, can we put that back up on, on, on the screen? Now, these lampstands, obviously, this is one that's not, you know, uh, ready to be in use right now. But when it was in the tabernacle in the temple, obviously, they had to have fuel what, what, what to burn it. And it was oil. They would put olive oil in these lamps, right? Well, what does oil represent in the Bible? Oil represents the Holy Spirit. So if we're to be a light of the world, like a lamp uh, uh, set on a hill... Only the Holy Spirit can empower us to do this. We have to depend on the Holy Spirit to empower us to be strong witnesses. You know how I know this? Because Jesus told us this specifically. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Telling, everybody say telling. Remember, we're talking about witnessing with our words. Actions too, but we got to tell them eventually. When the power of the Holy Spirit is upon you, you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Obviously, that's locally, regionally, nationally, and even globally. And that's what that's a picture of. Amen. So we got to shine our light by good deeds, serving, loving, helping, but also to be a witness with our words. And the third and final thing as we wrap it up today, and this one's crucial because this will derail the other two. Number three, you must refuse to allow darkness in your life. You must refuse to allow darkness in your life. Ephesians 5, 8, 9. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light of the Lord. So live as people of light. He put an exclamation point. I said it the way he wrote it. Live as people of light, right? For this light within you produces only what is good, good deeds, what is right, and what is true. Tell people the word of God. The word is true. The gospel is true. Live as people of light with no darkness. See, one of the main ways we allow, we, we refuse darkness and allow it, uh, not allow it to come into our lives is by letting the Lord make and mold and form us into who he has created and called us to be. Let's look at Numbers 8.4. Let's go back to our Old Testament text. Numbers 8.4. The entire lampstand from its base to its decorative blossoms was made of beaten gold. Y'all tracking with me yet? Let's put that back up, Abby, if you don't mind. Let's put up the lampstand again. So this lampstand's beautiful, right? Beautiful decoration, solid gold. All you can, if you can see, you, you got leaves and flowers and all the things. They didn't just throw a hunk of gold in there and it came out like that, right? There had to be a goldsmith or a team of them that was probably working and molding that thing and banging it and beating it and farming it to come out to be this beautiful thing that would be lit by the oil to shine its light in the tabernacle. Nobody likes to hear this, but we need to allow the Lord to make us and mold us and to form us. I didn't say it in the first service. I learned this years ago. I think it was from Pastor Rob, the meaning of this word many years ago. You know the scripture in Psalms that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart? You know that word delight in Hebrew means to be, to be pliable, right? Pastor Rob, I think I learned that from you. To be pliable, that means to be molded and made and formed into the Lord's image. And then he will give you the desires of your heart. You know why? Because then your desires are going to line up with his. But you got to allow him to, to, to work on you in the fire, 
to work on you in the fire life, to, to, to not allow this darkness. And he'll, he'll begin to, to do away with darkness. Listen, how does he do that? The main way is conviction. Let me encourage you, church. When you get convicted about some sin or some attitude, do not ignore it. Don't ignore it. When you hear the Holy Spirit talking to you, don't just dismiss it and be like, oh, that's not a big deal. I'm just, just a little thing. Oh, that's just the way my daddy was, so that's how I am. No, don't, don't go down that route. He's trying to mold you, make you, form you into beautiful gold so your light can shine with the oil of the Holy Spirit as the fuel. Amen? Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, that ain't no darkness in purity, right? If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. See, if we keep our lives pure without darkness and not allowing it in our lives, we'll be more effective. Can we put that, that picture up one more uh, time? Well, I don't know if it might be one more time, but put, put it up again. I got revelation first service as I was reading this. As I was reading this and I studied this, I've preached from the scripture many times. As I was reading in the first service, the Holy Spirit gave me some, some revelation. I thought about this. As we were in Israel, this was us. You can see me and a couple of the group behind. Ricky had that good photo eye. He went around and said, I'm going to go around and take a good picture of this. We're, we're walking around here and here's this beautiful six foot, about six foot tall gold lampstand that's going to be put in the third and final temple. And I begin to think there's a bulletproof case around it. There's a plaque talking about it. But I know around there somewhere, there were some trash cans, regular old plastic trash cans. You know the care that went into making this lampstand for the temple? Those trash cans were just mass produced in some factory somewhere. I don't know about you, church. I want to be like Jesus said, and I want to be a light shining in a beautiful lampstand powered by the oil of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be a regular trash can for everyday use. What about you? Amen. But we, 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 we can't allow darkness, sin, and impurity in our life, our hearts, our minds, our attitude. Again, the Holy Spirit will empower us just as it fuse, the oil fuse is the fuel for the lamp. He'll empower us to live holy, pure lives. Amen. Listen to this scripture. It always gets me. Luke eleven thirty six. 36. Jesus said, if you are filled with life, with light, with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant as though a floodlight were filling you with light. I love how Jesus emphasizes no dark corners. Dark corners is sin and impurities that nobody else knows about. It's in your life. It could be in my life. It could be in somebody's life that, that nobody knows about. It's a dark corner tucked away that nobody sees, but eventually they will. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. He said, make sure your life's flooded with light with no dark corners. Sadly, when I get back, first day I get back, I didn't know nothing about it. We've seen in the news recently the heartbreak and the consequence of, of even ministers having dark corners in their life. Things tucked away that come out eventually. And I'm not getting into all that. A lot of that stuff's not even known yet. But it's just heartbreaking that when you have dark corners in your life. I want to encourage you right now, church, as, as we wrap this thing up. Let you let there be no dark corners of sin, of impurity in your life. First of all, repent of your sin to the Lord and then confess it to somebody. It ain't got to be me. It ain't got to be a pastor. If you're a man, get with another man. Have him hold you accountable. Confess. If you're a woman, get with another woman. Because I know James says, confess your sins to one another so you may be healed. We repent and confess to God to be forgiven. You, you, you confess to another person to be healed so they can help you walk in accountability. Amen. I remember, and I'll wrap it up and end it with this. I remember hearing one pastor say this, and I love it. You're only as sick as your secrets. You're only as sick as your secrets. When you have something hidden away, tucked away in a dark corner in your life, you may not think anybody else knows about it, but that thing's there. It's gonna, you can continue to be spiritually sick, relationally, and it's going to come out. Make sure your sin will find you out, and it always happens. Guys, let us not have no dark corners in our life. Let us repent. In a minute, I'm going to open up the altars for you to pray and people to come up. Some people got prayed for. And you don't even have to come to this altar, but get with somebody. 
Get with somebody I can walk with. You get in a life group, come to Man Cave and Thrive Wednesday, smaller settings where you can connect with somebody. As I close today, you know, we've all sang the song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Well, that's cute for children's church, but it's not biblically accurate. What did Jesus say? He said, let your light be a floodlight. Amen. A floodlight that goes out. And we know in South Louisiana, most of us know about floodlights, right? Those of you that have gone out maybe early morning hunting or frogging or something like that, and you need that light to go forward. As Blair sitting right there, there have been many mornings where me and Blair were in the basin in a boat, and I had no idea where his brother was going. He was following his phone, and one of us was holding the light, and we needed that light. And it had to be a flood light. couldn't just be a light on my phone. I could light up the boat maybe, but not the trees in the Chafalaya Basin we're going, because I'm thinking, you know, Blair's about to decapitate me with one of these branches. But he got us back safely every time. Thank you, Blair. But we needed a light, right, Blair? And a floodlight, a flood, because it's complete darkness out there. You can't see anything. There's a lot of danger, right? And that's even, a, he knew where he was going by his, that's actually another good illustration. He knew and he was guiding the boat because he knew where it was going and we needed light, right? The Holy Spirit will light our lives, but we got to be the light to the world. The Holy Spirit leads us. And as our light shine in the dark world, it leads the path of Jesus. If not, people are dying and going to hell every day because of the destruction that's in this world. Because this world is in complete darkness. Are y'all following me? So, like we say in South Louisiana, I don't want to just have a little light. I want, I want my light to be big, big, Shad. How about you? I want my light to be big, big. So as we wrap this thing up, John 12, 36, Jesus said, put your trust in the light while there is still time. When you become children, then you will become children of the light. Jesus is speaking of himself. Put your trust in the light while there's still time. Y'all, we're not promised tomorrow. I talked about lunch. We're not promised lunchtime today. Am I right? I'm not trying to be discouraging, to scare you, to be morbid. But isn't it true? We don't know the Lord could come back before I finish this up, this, this altar call and this, and, and this invitation. Why there's still time? Have you put your trust in Jesus? See, there's a misconception in our own doctrine that everybody is a child of God. That scripture makes it clear again. He said, if you put your trust in the light, then you become children of the light. Not everybody is a child of God. God loves everybody. You remember, I just said it earlier, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. He loves everybody that he sent his only begotten son. But you must trust in him and give your life to him to become a child of the light, to be a child of God. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? If you say, Brandon, I don't know if I've trusted in the Lord, trusted in the light of Christ. Man, I feel like there's a lot of darkness in my life. I know there's darkness. And you say, man, I don't know where I'd be headed if I breathed my last here, heaven or hell, where I'd spend eternity. Bible makes it clear we will spend eternity somewhere. And you say, today, Brandon, I want to give my life to Christ. I need to be born again. If that's you, just slip up your hand. Say, man, that's me. That's me. I surrender. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Say, that's me over here to my right. I see more hands going up. Thank you. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for your boldness. Come on. They had a young man that, that, that lifted his hand. I told you all that. He, got, he, gave, he surrendered this first service and got baptized. If that's you, anybody else with your hands raised? If your hands raised in the back, I see you, sir. I see you. More importantly, the Lord sees you. Say, man, I, I want to trust in Jesus. I want this darkness gone in my life. I want to be flooded with light and be a child of light. If that's you, come on. Can we all pray this together? Those of you that raised your hand at LPCC, if that's your decision, y'all pray with me as a church this morning. Can we all pray together? Lord Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying in my place. Thank you, Lord, for being the light of the world. I know that I've sinned. I repent of my sin. And I ask that you please forgive me. Lord, would you help me? And would you fill me with your light that I can live a life that shines bright and glorifies you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Come on, let's rejoice with these this morning. Amen. Hey, listen, just as that young man, he surrendered his life or resurrendered earlier, first service and got baptized. I wouldn't plan on doing this. If you lifted your hand and you just gave your life to Christ for the first time or rededicated, I'll stay back here. I'll baptize you right after the service if you want. Amen. We still got some shirts and some shorts, I'm sure. If you got your, we'll give you a shirt. We'll give you some shorts and I'll stay in and we'll baptize you. And you can switch back into your clothes you came in. Go home with a church t-shirt. And just like that, you can be saved. 
and then get water baptized and we encourage you to get connected to Next Steps Life Group. Encourage you, believe for you to get filled with the Spirit, get discipled and move forward. Amen. Would you stand up with me? Can I get the pastors and the altar workers to come uh, to the altar, please? And there's a couple of things I want to pray for. And Again, first of all, how many of you say, man, I want to be a special vessel. I want to be used by the Lord to be the light of Jesus. How many of you say, that's me, brother? That's me. Come on, can we pray about that right now? Father, help us to be, to shine our light, to be the light of the world, to be intentional. Come on, ask the Lord. Help us to be creative in how we are intentional with good deeds and good works, helping and serving others. Lord, I pray, help us to be bold witnesses, that we use our words to be a witness. Help us to be, like God, witnesses of the light by telling people the truth and our story about Jesus. And then, Lord, I pray we have no dark corners in our life, that we refuse any darkness. Lord, I pray even right now for conviction of anyone that knows that there's some secret sin in their life, some darkness that maybe no one else knows about, not even a spouse, close friend that they've been hiding. But right now, under the power and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I pray they begin to repent and confess that sin and team up with someone, like God, that can walk with them. So we have no dark corners, that we have a flood light shining in our lives. Lord, I pray that over, Lord God, your people, myself, my family, Lord God, our church and beyond. May you be glorified. Help us even today as we go to lunch to shine our light forward, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, listen. If you, you need prayer for anything, maybe there's something you've been dealing with. You say, man, I got this darkness I've been struggling with. Maybe it's a, an addiction. Maybe it's some secret, somebody. Listen, I mean, you don't have to do this, but I want to encourage you if you're struggling to come up here. Let somebody pray with you. Get connected. Get in a life group. We want to walk with you and help you. If you need prayer for anything else, the pastors, altar workers are here. If not, God bless you. So good to be back. We love you guys. Man Cave and Thrive Night, Wednesday night. If you want to get baptized, you just got saved. We'll be here. Come let me know. We'll baptize you before you leave. We love you. Have a great day. See you soon.